There are moments in your life when God intends to bring a blessing through you to someone else, but it has to come uniquely through you because there are some things only you can do. There are some needs only you can see, some hands only you can hold, some prayers only you can pray, some tears only you can cry, some gifts only you can give, some meals only you can cook. There are some people only you can reach, some moments only you can take. Think about it. God placed you in your specific family, in this generation, in this time in history, in your unique demographic situation, in this specific geographic location, so that you can make a difference there. What's your difficult step of obedience that's right in front of you? A great God made you to be great, so act like it. Don't miss your moment. Welcome to Treasure Lake Church. I hope those words seem inspiring. There are some things that only you can do. I think you can argue that from this thought. God Almighty has good works that are designed for us to fulfill and he designed them before the creation of the world. There are specific assignments that come to us and to no one else. And because God Almighty has blessed us with those assignments, we find that our life is full of all sorts of meaning and purpose. And as we get a chance to serve him, we watch his blessing my goodness, flow through us to other people. That is amazing. Thank you that you're spending some time with Treasure Lake Church today as we attempt to be a group of people who pursue all that God has asked us to, to capture all that God has asked us to fulfill, and we are trusting for his spirit to give us the strength to do all of that. Today, I'm super happy thinking about, well, things that have gone on this past week, how wonderful it was to see light the night taking place, all sorts of kids enjoying the great truth that Jesus is the light of the world. May we cling to that with our everything and may we praise him. I really am thrilled to see young ones, let the little ones come to the, to the Lord and uh, God Almighty is doing that right here. Today, as we pray, all sorts of requests should be flooding our minds, of course, for our nation of course, with what it's going through with an election. More than this election, may God give us generations of godly leaders. We have people who would love to feel better and to be healed up. Doug Odger, certainly, and Jim Rittenhouse. Carol Downer, after having a bit of an accident that took place that's uh, keeping her off of her feet because it's uh, painful to try to get around. We're thankful that she's doing better, but we're praying that God would heal her. Everyone who's battling with cancer, the path is usually not short, and there are ways that you need to be able to rebound from treatment and be strong enough for the next. So, of course, we'll be praying for Beth and Denise and for Todd and Aunt Betty and Charles and Dale and Steph and Sue. We want to pray that God Almighty would be a great blessing to Natalie, that she would have the transplant. Let's take some time and praise God and pray for these people that we care so much about. Lord, we thank you that you have designed for us good works that you envisioned before the creation of the world, and we pray that we would enjoy the task of walking in your ways. Thank you that you use us in your kingdom. Use our hands and our words, our, th our thoughtfulness, Teach us how it is that we can love others and show them the love of Christ. Father, make us that sort of people that we spur each other on to these love and good deeds, which are the ones that have been designed by you. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much that you love this country and we pray for a great result of an election that's coming up. Our bigger prayer is generations of godly leaders. Please, Father, give them to us. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for light the night and for the praise that went to Jesus and for kids that are thinking about how Jesus is the light of the world. Thank you that you beat back the darkness and you have shown us the way to go. Father, we pray that your healing hand would be with Beth and Eleanor and Denise, Todd and Betty and Mike. We pray for Dale and Kathy, Steph, Sue, Don and Nick and, and Lisa, asking that you remove the cancer that affects them thanking you that we can pray yet again, saying, Father, bring your blessing and bring your healing. Give Doug strength. We pray that he would be able to have really good days. We ask that you would heal up Carol after an accident, that you would give clarity of thought to Rich and to Bob and to Kim and Joanne. 
Father, we pray that you would bless Bill and restore him to great strength. We pray for Carol that you would encourage her in these days. We pray to Heavenly Father that by your goodness and by your grace that we would walk in your ways, that we would know how to love you, and that we would love you very, very well. Thank you that we have infinitely great things to look forward to. Teach us what they are and teach us to tune in when you tell us what you hold in the future for us. May you be praised because you are so good. We, your people, wanted to take some time and say, we love you much. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. May you be praised. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine? So great a mercy What heart could fathom Such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin And bear my shame The cross has spoken I am forgiven The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living home. Hallelujah, praise the Lord.
Hey church family, have you ever been super motivated by something? It happens to me every year. I just love being part of Operation Christmas Child. Let me tell you why. Yo tenía nueve años cuando me dieron mi regalo a, a través de la iglesia. Solo Dios me tocó y sentí en mi corazón algo fuerte. Ya ves, yo sumergí el pecado mío desde hace tiempo y yo no puedo regresar atrás. A mí me encanta compartir lo que es la Biblia con mi hermanito pequeño, Yalil. Y yo le digo a la gente, amistades, que busquen a Dios. When I was 14 years old, I started teaching my first The Greatest Journey lesson. If I shared the gospel to them, I really, really hope that they share the gospel with everyone they know. The heart of Operation Christmas Child is evangelism, discipleship, and multiplication. Because we bring gifts to the children, the mothers and the fathers accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. In every church, we are teaching them how to reach out to their neighbors. Operation Christmas Child became the answer from God. Children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And it's time for us to go where no one else went, so the gospel can cover this earth just the way the water covered the ocean. Let's pray for the outreach to continue. It has to be our burden to reach them with the gospel. Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. So we need to keep packing those boxes and continue to pray for the children around the world as we begin to disciple them. God bless you, thank you. That's an amazing picture of what is going to happen. God's blessings are going to be sent all over the world. We have a chance to touch lives in the name of Jesus. You've noticed today at the front of the church, we have stacks of boxes. They are here for you to take. Each box has instructions inside on how to fill the boxes. You can choose to give a gift for a girl or a boy. There's a good chance that the gifts you send will be their greatest surprise of their holiday. Bring the boxes back by Sunday, November 24th, and we will take them to the truck that will head out from Dubois to the distribution center. At this time of year, how are you praying for our country? We feel it, elections matter. Who leads us forward matters. I'm praying that God's children will be motivated to grab this opportunity and express their convictions through the privilege of voting. I'm praying that we will be blessed with godly leaders. I'm thrilled that our church gets to serve the community by being one of the voting centers. May we experience God's grace on November 5th. With November just around the corner, there are good things heading our way. Have you thought about becoming a member here at TLC? We would be so happy to have you join the church. The way to do this is to be part of our membership discussions. On Sunday, November 10th and 17th, those discussions will take place in the church library at 10 a.m. Come ask your questions and learn about TLC. We look forward to seeing you there. We will be collecting diapers and wipes for a local Dubois ministry. This will help local mothers who need assistance with their little ones. The collection deadline is Sunday, November 10th. Thanksgiving is on the horizon. Would you like to do it together? TLC puts on a big Thanksgiving feast. We have people from TLC and the community join us for the scrumptious occasion. Dinner starts at noon. You can sign up to reserve your place or you can let us know that you would like to be a volunteer making this happen. You'll find signups at the welcome desk. Would you be interested in helping out at the Dubois Food Pantry on the morning of Thursday, November 14th? We will be packing bags of food for the many people who depend on this assistance. If you would like to help, please give the church office a call. 
If this is your first time with us, thanks for being here. We welcome you. Please find the welcome card in the pew in front of you, fill it out, and leave it in the basket on your way out of the sanctuary. I recall a moment back in the early 90s in which I was eagerly awaiting something. Sherry and I found ourselves in Eastern Europe. We had settled into Romania. We were figuring out life in a post-communist country. It was challenging. And back in those days, we didn't have very many people visit because of all of the uncertainty that was associated with a country like Romania. But one day my parents said that they were going to come and visit. Bless them for that. So Sherry and I, we went to the airport, and we can still remember very much what it was like. Uh, we were in a space that was uh, in the waiting area for those who would be coming out of the airport, and I suppose in this cramped space there were a thousand of us waiting for the folk to come off that aircraft. And ahead of us there was uh, some doors that would slide open and shut, and each time that the door would slide open it would give you this little glimpse of what was going on back behind the doors. And, and when the doors would slide open and someone would walk through, all thousand of us would, would raise up on our tiptoes and we would, we would look to see if we could see our loved one who was back there there, realizing that they were running a gauntlet of passport control and customs and bureaucracy which wasn't familiar with them and and a sea of people time and time again rose on their tiptoes to stare at somebody they were waiting to see and the way that that all of that raising up on tiptoes ended were big hugs and tears of seeing the people that loved you so very much I I remember well waiting on tiptoes for my parents to walk out of those sliding glass doors. Today we find ourselves in the book of Romans, chapter 8. We're picking up with verse 18, which says this. I consider the present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Context can be so very important. These words are associated with where we ended last week. Last week we were talking about the amazing truth that we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ Jesus. He has invited us into his family. He has brought us in as his kids. And he is going to give us responsibilities in the kingdom. And he will prepare us to be those who will work with him. It is a thrill. It is an amazing opportunity. And Paul says this, in light of what we have as heirs with Christ, I want you to know that the sufferings that you are currently going through, well, they are not so bad. Well, I think we could look at that and say, are you serious? Are you trying to say that sufferings aren't so bad? Who in the world talks like that? And yet the truth is there. Sufferings are not necessarily so very awful and bad. I think you could ask any mother if she might have something to say about that. I've heard tell that the uh, process of bringing a new life into this world is uh, wonderful and it is also extremely inconvenient. You could ask a mother what months seven, eight, and nine were like in the pregnancy. And yet mothers knew that after those months you were going to have the great traumatic moment of suffering in which you would bring a child into the world. But most mothers would say, my goodness, when I did that, I just want you to know that it was totally worth it. For the thrill of seeing that new life, of being able to hold my child, of knowing that we would love each other and that we would spend our days together, oh my goodness, I would do it all over again. And this week, as I interacted with various mothers, would it surprise you to know that not a single one shared a story of complaining how difficult it was, their sufferings in order for Zoe and Olivia and Ethan and Dan to join them. Not a single one complained about that. And why is that the case? Is it because they forgot about their sufferings? No, it's because the great joy that they have in raising that child far exceeds any of the sufferings that they endured. And if you were to ask a mother, Mom, was it worth it? She would say, my goodness, is it worth it? You see, here is the principle, is that the present sufferings, they are not worth comparing with the glories that follow. And God Almighty, he has glories that will 
follow. So Paul in this verse, he talks about sufferings and he says, you know what sufferings they are on the way as God is making us to become the people that are his heirs. And God Almighty, he will use a process of chiseling and planing and molding us so that we become the people that he wants us to be. There will be correction and changing habits, changing affections when we'll find that at times we'll be rejected by others, we'll be misunderstood, we will find that there are consequences to our sin and prices to pay and the suffering is rather clear and it is very present. Oh, we have sufferings, but Paul says, know this. Know that what's coming in comparison with what you're going through, what you're going through isn't really that much because what's coming is going to be so good. God Almighty will transform you so that you will actually fit well into the glorious kingdom that he has prepared And you will agree that your present sufferings should not be compared with the glories that are coming your way. C.S. Lewis, a master of words and deep thoughts, has expressed it this way. If we consider the staggering nature of the rewards that are promised to us in the Gospels, it would seem that God Almighty finds our desires not too strong, but too too weak we're half-hearted creatures Uh, we fool around with things like drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is coming our way we're like a child who wants to go on playing in the mud in the ghetto because he can't imagine that a vacation at the seaside really exists god almighty has a vacation for us at the seaside with wonders and experiences that outstrip anything that we can imagine. And when we get to that seaside, we will find ourselves saying that those sufferings that we went through are small in comparison with the great glories that God Almighty has prepared for us. And and that thought leads Paul to an interesting new thought in which he says this, for the creation awaits waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and glory of the children of God. We haven't changed on the theme of suffering and My goodness, we can pity ourselves for all of the suffering that we go through, and perhaps we should, but could we stop for a moment and ponder, might there be another entity that is also suffering with us at the same time? And here in this text, Paul says, well, there certainly is. You see, something happened when mankind sinned. When mankind sinned, he introduced distortion, deformity into all of God's great creation. And the consequences of man's sin did not just fall upon man, but it fell upon the created order. We know exactly from what God said to Adam in Genesis chapter 3, for he said, Cursed is the ground because of you. You have sinned and now the ground is cursed. And in pain you will eat of it. And here's how the ground changes. Thorns and thistles will bring forth. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat bread till you return to the ground. It is not just you who are affected by the choices that you have made. Your stumbling and your rebellion has rocked the creation itself and given an opportunity for our enemy to work. And as Paul puts it, since that moment in time, creation was subjected to frustration and it needs to be liberated from the bondage of decay. The pristine state of all that God had made and it was as it should be. When the apex creation man created in his image rebelled against him, it was changed. And so the way that I see it is this is prior to our sin, I really do not believe that there would have been a hurricane such as Helene on this planet. Prior to our sin, I don't believe that man would have suffered with cancer. I don't believe that he would have been burdened by genetic mutations. I don't believe that coral reefs would have oxidized quickly and died. I don't believe that people would have suffered with personal identity issues like low 
self-image or self-loathing or an inability to escape resentment. Prior to our sin, there would have been no one who would have called evil good and good evil. Prior to our sin, everything was in a state so amazing we could hardly fathom it, but I am convinced of this. Prior to our sin, harmony was more harmonious than what we know. Synergy was more synergistic than what we can fathom. Order was more orderly than anything we have seen. And majesty showed up in places that we could not fathom it would be there. And in this great world, there was no need for forgiveness anywhere on the planet whatsoever. And then decay entered and appeared. And it disrupted the order that God had created. It twisted and marred everything. You see, I believe that Eden was such a remarkable place that it cannot be compared with Tahiti today, for even this Tahiti is affected by decay and by frustration and our sinful rebellion. Eden was better than St. Thomas and St. Kitts, uh, St. Thomas and the island of Kitts that have really good weather. And we unleashed forces that we despise that have marred creation itself. I sort of see the way that things happened a little bit like this. You see, despite the fact that the projectile hits just one portion of the glass, the impact spreads throughout the entire glass pane. It spreads everywhere, it reverberates, it touches absolutely everything. There is a drastic disturbance that affects everything and God Almighty says, this is my eyewitness account of what happened when man sinned against me. There was destruction and implication which spread absolutely everywhere and I'm of the opinion that if you wanted to chronicle all of the distortions and disruptions that happened since that time, and if you had all of the pages involved in the complete set of volumes of an encyclopedia, you would not have enough space to chronicle all of the distortions that rolled out from that event. We find that things were truly broken and injured, which raises the question, is this the only option that we have for the future? Or is it possible that by God's grace that he can restore something? Can he put back together everything and be as pristine as it once was? Will he restore the created order? And indeed he will. He will do that at the same time in which we, the children of God, are promoted into our eternal state and become full operational heirs of the kingdom. For you see, creation awaits with eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed when God will restore things as they should be. And that phrase that we're looking at, the creation waits with eager expectations, has been translated by some. Creation is standing on its tiptoes, eagerly awaiting a transformation that it has been pining after for so long. It's on its tiptoes the way that a child looks for a friend who's coming over. On its tiptoes the way that a child can't wait for that gift to be given on his or her birthday. So creation waits on its tiptoes for a restoration that God Almighty will bring. I'm convinced of this. We are not the cause of that, rep- of that restoration, but we will be the recipients of that restoration. And therefore, the kingdom in which God will have us living and working will not be a kingdom that looks like Youngstown and Harrisburg and Kerwinsville today. It will be a kingdom which looks like Eden. It will be phenomenal. And when God restores what he has planned, we will not be talking, saying that it looks like a blue state or a red state. We will simply say that it is a perfect state For everything is as God has it to be. And we will say to God at that moment, thanks be to God who has removed all of the decay, all of the distortion, all of the frustration, and he has restored it to a state as it should be. And at that moment when we are invited to be heirs of that glorious kingdom, we will all say, My goodness, all of the suffering that I went through up until this moment, it was a mere pittance compared with the glories of what God Almighty has given to me. I want to try one other 
analogy because who am I to talk about what it is like for a mother to be giving birth or to go through the difficulties of bearing a child? I know nothing of that. And yet pain and suffering, it comes in 10,000 different forms, and I do know some of those forms. I understand the pain and suffering that is associated with learning a second language. There's reasons why in this country we feel like, well, we're just not very good at that. Uh, We don't like walking through the process, which is very humbling. No one likes to talk like a toddler when they're 25 years old. No one likes to do their very best and find that people are snickering and laughing at what you say. Nobody wants to find that every sentence that they said needs to be corrected. It takes hours and hours. You make so many mistakes. It is a humbling process. And when you learn to speak it, you find that you still can't write it effectively. It is a huge humbling challenge that is a painful process. But with time, comprends limba aia, Și înțelegi tot care trebuie să fii spus și chiar găsesc cuvintele care exprim inima ta. Cu timp în care tu înțelegi fiecare lucru care este spus în jurul tău și chiar poți să spui o glumă. În timp când lupta limbii este câștigat și ajunge să fie al tău. Și prin limba aia tu poți să exprimi mesajul cel mai important în toată lumea, prin care acest mesaj, oameni poate să fie adus la Hristos pentru viață veșnică. Oh, când ajungi la acel moment, atunci îți dai seama că toate suferințele pe care, prin care ai trecut, am meritat. Toate. Faptul este că suferința ta a fost un mic, mic preț de plătit pentru ocazia de a vesti Evanghelia lui Christos oamenilor. It is a small price to pay. As the Apostle Paul said, I consider our present sufferings not worth comparing with that glory that will be revealed to us on that day. There will be great, great glory. Where does that leave us now? I think that Paul wants to address that in his next verses. In verse 22, Paul says this. We know that the whole creation has been, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we eagerly await for the adoption of sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Well, this text, I think, reminds us that there's two things that fell apart when we've rebelled against God. We fell apart and the creation fell apart, and that means that there is a common groaning that both experience. I think that the word groan is most fitting. We know what it is to groan. We pull up to the drive through window, and that is just the moment when the milkshake machine went on the fritz. Thank you very much. You are trying to finish your assignment, and just when you are almost at the finish line, the internet goes out, and you let out a terrible groan. You're about to fall asleep, and it dawns on you that you have double-booked yourself for meetings that both take place tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. You have a favorite team who has a best player, and he has just torn his Achilles in the very first game. We know what it is to groan because groaning happens when we understand things should be so much better than this. Just how big is the groaning that Paul refers to here? He says, it is a groaning that creation experiences akin to the pains of childbirth. That is the kind of groaning that cannot be ignored. That is the kind of groaning that tells you you depend on someone else to show up with health. That is a first order magnitude groaning and creation groans for that moment. And what the text says to us is that we groan with creation and we eagerly await. That is the exact same phrase used previously that can be described as we wait on our tippy toes to see that which is coming. We wait for something to be better. We wait for our bodies to be cancer free 
and cancer immune, for our minds to understand far more and our wisdom to not be duped. We wait for our society to actually pull us to God, not away from him, and we long for the freedom from a sin nature that just won't stop hassling us. We long for something better. We wait looking for it on our tippy toes, knowing that when it comes, we will be absolutely thrilled and so together with all of creation we long we long for our bodies to be renewed for our minds to be changed for us to walk in the presence of God almighty and for all of the groaning of our lives to cease we wait on our tippy toes for that and I am among the groaners waiting for that moment Paul says, for in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. Uh, This is the hope that we were saved for, the hope that the groaning will end, that the disappointments will stop, that the way things were would return, and one day so shall it be, and that is not our current experience. You see, our current experience is a groan in which we find ourselves susceptible to the 19,000 different diseases currently identified by science. We find ourselves groaning with an uncertainty that's so great that people talk about Murphy's Law showing up all the time. We groan knowing that snowblowers break, the promises are broken, and that the wonderful insurance policies that we have just create more hoops that we have to jump through. We groan, we wait, we are waiting for something great. And no matter who it is who sits in the White House for the next four years, in fact, you could take whoever it is and combine every man, woman, and child in all of D.C., we know that what we are waiting for and groaning for cannot be delivered to us by them. There is but one who can bring it to us. His name is Jesus. He is our Savior, and we wait for a transformation that he can bring that we can't drive. We wait for a change that he can induce that we can hardly imagine. We wait for him to show up and to make the great change of all. And the beautiful thing is this, is that this change, it is coming. It is coming, and God will bring it. Praise the Lord. So as we wait for that great change to come, where does it leave us? I think that Paul addresses that in the last verses that we look at today. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our heart knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. These verses lead me to thoughts on the clumsiness and the boldness of prayer. I actually think this text opens up a conversation that that we need to have because sometimes there just might be a bit of an elephant in the room and the elephant can be described as the clumsiness and the boldness of prayer. Let's see how Paul opens up that topic for us. Paul says this, that there are times that we don't even know what to pray for. Well, aren't you glad that someone said it? Aren't you glad that Paul calls a spade a spade? That there are times that we're not even quite sure, God, should I be asking for this or should be asking for that? It's not quite clear to me, Lord, my relative is suffering with cancer, and I've prayed so many times that she would be healed. But Lord, should I be praying that she's healed, or should I be praying that you would take her home? God, I just don't know. I don't know what to pray. God, I have a new job opportunity that seems to be coming my way, and my goodness, doesn't it pay a lot more? And at the same time, it pays a lot more. It sure requires a lot more of me, and and yet we don't seem to be able to find any family time right now. God, should I be asking for that job or should I not be asking for that job? God, I just don't quite know what I should be praying for. Paul calls a spade a spade. He said that's where we're living. And what he wants us to know is when we don't know what we are praying for, that we are not praying 
alone. For the Spirit of God intercedes with us in this communication and he communicates with God on our behalf. And I am thoroughly convinced that there are times that the Spirit says to God Almighty, hey, you may want to pass over what Dave just asked for because that is not at all what he really needs. There is a clumsiness that is associated with prayer. There's a clumsiness that we're not quite sure what we should be asking for, and then there's a clumsiness of we're not quite sure if we know how to ask it. We can find ourselves in front of God Almighty and have all of the poise that we would feel if we instantly were ushered into the presence of King Charles and needed to carry on a conversation. We can feel like we are not so good at our communication, and on any given Sunday morning here at church when there's... 20 different prayer requests that are shared, I find myself experiencing the clumsiness of my prayer, wondering, God, how is it that I should pray for each one of these prayer requests? God, lead me and show me, and I have a feeling that I'm rather clumsy as I do so, and yet, as we are clumsy in our prayers, there is a truth that we hold on to, for God has said, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. We approach with confidence because we are the adopted kids of God Almighty, heirs of God's family. We approach God boldly because he loves us dearly. And a parent who loves their child dearly is not overly uptight about the grammar and the expression that the communication comes in. I remember when Justin and Christy were small. They didn't just grow up with great grammar all the time. I remember perhaps in particular that Christy for a real long time just couldn't learn the word she. The only word that she had was her. And so Christy would talk about her as my friend and her fell fell down and her told me this. The interesting thing is is that uh, while she was using those grammatical expressions which were a bit clumsy I never once had to struggle with what it is that she was saying and I love the fact that she wanted to talk with me and as her father I I understood despite the fact that her phrases were not so articulate and may we never think that we are so wise that we could spin a phrase that is good enough for the courts of heaven we are clumsy all throughout this life and God Almighty says come and pray because you have this resource of the Spirit praying with you. And thus we return in chapter 8 to the topic of the Spirit. And let's remember, the Spirit and the believer, they come together and are so tight that you can't shove the blade of a knife between the two. And the Spirit is our great resource, and we have found out that the Spirit is praying for us. And therefore, with courage, we press on, knowing that great things are coming. And because of these promises of God, we should live this way. Our lives should be lived on our tippy toes. Waiting for the most extraordinary promotion in which God Almighty will enable us to be heirs with him in a kingdom that is not defiled, it is not frustrated, it has no decay, everything is all as it should be. We are his adopted children, we are his heirs, so let us come before him with boldness, knowing that the Spirit prays with us and say, Dad, here I am, I certainly do love you, and thank you for what you have in store for me. Honestly, I can't wait. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you would teach us to live on our tiptoes, full of excitement of what you have in store for us. We thank you that you have made us your heirs. And there are tasks that you have that are worthy of the kingdom that you will give to us. It is absolutely amazing. We know that it will be thrilling. It will be powerful. We will be in a kingdom that is beyond anything that we have seen so far. Thank you that this is what is in store for us. And in the meantime, we thank you, Spirit, that you are there interceding with us with groans and that words cannot express. We have such a resource in you. Father, teach us to pray boldly. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.